Because <laughs> I normally, I got off of it two years ago. Why? I was, um, I worked for, I used to work for the federal government. <clears throat> I was working on some pretty sensitive stuff at the time, and I didn't need to have a, a real big social media presence. I'm back on it now. I don't work on it anymore. Good evening and welcome to Perspective, your interactive community interest program. It is Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015, and we are here to give voice to our community from your perspective. Call and join in the conversation at 225-343-1075. That's 225-343-1075. I am Alfreda Tillman Bester, along with my co-hosts, Attorney Reverend Joyce Marie Plummer and Attorney Taryn Branson. If you have difficulty with reception for our show, if you are traveling, or just for the convenience, you can listen live over the internet for crystal clear reception at www.wtqt.org. That's www.wtqt.org. Please follow us on Twitter at UR Perspective. That's the letter U. The letter R, P E R S P E C T I V E. I want to thank all of those people who have joined us on Twitter in the last few weeks, and I thank you for all of the information that you're sharing with us. And I appreciate that you appreciate the, the uh, tweets that we're sending out between Tuesdays. Like I said before, it's a long time between Tuesdays. Today we are talking about police violence and we want to welcome to the studio Mr. Jamar Montgomery. Jamar Montgomery is a systems engineer and he is a Southern University Law Center candidate for um, a JD degree uh, 2016. He is also the author of Militarized uh, Police and the Under, I'm sorry, Militarized Police and the unpermitted protest, implementing policy that civilizes the, the police. For the update, I think, I'm sorry, we had a caller already? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the caller because I think we must have said something already that uh, got them on. So we're going to call you. You are on the air with Perspective. Hello? Hello? I'm well. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. My name is Maya Bell. I was calling about, uh, you know, what I was talking about, the topic. Yes. Yes, and I turned my life around, and like I say, you know, it's, a, it's sad how they doing things out here. He's getting away with things, you know. There's a lot of crooked cops on the board that usually they, they take the businesses the wrong way. You know, there's a lot of good cops out there, too, that's what we're were more involved. Yes, um, and, more and, involved with each other and coming together, you know, and trying to remove the ones that's doing it to us. And so that's that's how I really look at it. So it's, they can't blame it just on the cops and they can't just blame it on us because it's us not sticking together. When they see something, they don't go report it or they feel like, oh, I'm a red or I'm a snitch. So as a community, we need to just come together if you see something not right and just stand up for what's right. So if you see something, say something. That's, that's, that's how I look at it, if you want the community to be better. So let me ask you one question, because this is something that I've had a private conversation about, and I want to bring it to the forefront. Um, yes, we, we have seen a lot of uh, tape uh, or video of police officers acting badly. 
but often in our community when we have bad actors who are victimizing members of our community we don't not only do we not have video we also don't have people who want to talk or who 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 feel like they can come forward and and uh and and, and hold people accountable for hurting members of our community how do you feel about that do you think that's something that we need to oops we lost that caller Okay, that's okay. So, so, so to have people of the community not only be uh, be available to hold the police accountable, but to hold other perpetrators of crimes accountable. Yes, ma'am. Well, like I like I say, I used to be out there, and I felt like I was targeted. Right. It don't always be the person inside. It don't be the person doing the things half the time. Sometimes they could portray you to be someone that you're not. Right. Don't really be doing those things, and they target the wrong people okay. in the community. And when they need to be targeting the ones that's really doing it, and the ones that's not doing it, they're targeting the wrong ones. Thank you so much, callers. Keep listening to us. Call us back if you like. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. For the update, and then we're going to really get into this, right? Okay, so he was excited. I'm glad to have that caller call in and talk to us. Louisiana and our country lost a great lady on yesterday, June 1st, 2015, with the passing of former Southern University President uh, Dolores Margaret Richard Spikes. Dr. Spikes was the first African-American and the first Southern University graduate to earn a PhD in mathematics from Louisiana State University in 1971. In 1988, Dr. Spikes became the first woman in the United States to head a university system when she accepted the position of president of the Southern University A&M College system. She was the wife of the late Herman Spikes and the mother of the late Rhonda Spikes Brown, both who preceded her in death. She is survived by a very special sister, uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Richard Belair. Uh, the two were really inseparable. Most of the time when I saw Dr. Spikes, I saw Mrs. Belair. And I know that she had other relatives, but those were the ones that I knew. And so to the Southern University family, to the Baton Rouge community, to the state of Louisiana, to the United States, um, we lost a great lady in Dolores Margaret Spikes. Um, I hope that you will keep her family in your prayers and um, if we get information about the services, we will certainly pass it along. Uh, but I would add, encourage you to watch the, uh, the, the newspaper for the services. I also want to uh, extend condolences uh, to our Vice President, uh, Joe Biden, lost his son, Bo, his namesake, Joe Biden the uh, third, over the weekend. And um, I've heard nothing but kind, uh, complimentary things about Bo Biden, the sacrifices that he has made, including when his dad was not named president and everyone in Delaware wanted him to run for his dad's seat and everybody said he was a shoe in for his dad's seat. But he said, no, I have a case that I have to finish up as the attorney general for the state of Delaware. And it was a sex offender case. Um, you know, who does that? Somebody that's called by God to do it, you know? And so I, 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 I offer my condolences and, and uh, would say to the Biden family, if they were listening, that you are in our prayers and we're so sorry for your loss. The National Southern Christian Leadership Conference is holding its annual convention in Baton Rouge, July 23rd through 26th at the Hilton Baton Rouge Capital Center. Confirmed guests include, um, we're really going today with them. Uh, confirmed guests include um, uh, Dr. Bernard, 
callers, stay on the air with me. We're going to get to you in just a second. Just stay with me. Um, Hello? St stay with me, caller. We're going to get to you in just a second. Can you hold okay, on? I don't want to get on there no more. I just had calls and I was talking about the cops with you. I don't want to get on there no more. I want to tell you something. Okay, you're going to have to call me after the show, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, we're, great. What time the show over we're over at 6.30, so just listen to us and call us after the show. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. technical difficulty there. Okay, so um, confirmed guests include Dr. Bernard Lafayette, Chair of the Board of Directors of the SCLC, Dr. Charles Steele, uh, President and CEO of uh, the SCLC, Avery DuVernay, the writer, producer, and director of Selma, and uh, some of the cast members are also expected, Victoria Rao, formerly of The Young and the Restless, and many, many more. For more information, call 404-522-1420. That's 404-522-1420. Or you may email uh, for more information at info, that's I-N-F-O, at nationalsclc.org. That's I-N-F-O at nationalsclc.org. Caller, if, you're, if you would like to get on the air, just stay on hold for me. We'll be with you in just a second. On March 23rd, 20, 2012, after Trayvon Martin was murdered by George Zimmerman in Sanford, Sanford, Florida, President Barack Obama said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. When I think about this boy, I think about my own kids. This very human statement sent right-wing extremists into a crazy frenzy. With the exception of the Henry Louis Gates matter in, 20, uh, in, in 2009, when Professor Gates was arrested for breaking into his own home and disavowing, and I gotta say, disavowing his own pastor, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, um, the president had really kind of gone silent on issues that had to do with race. When Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, after peaceful protesters were greeted by a militarized police department, the president sent Attorney General Eric Holder to review police practices in Ferguson. Eric Holder showed up, showed out, and Ferguson is now under a consent decree. When Cleveland showed a certain affinity for summarily meeting out gratuitous physical abuse and summarily murdering African Americans, the United States Department of Justice was sent in and Cleveland is now under a consent decree. When Freddie Gray was murdered in Baltimore, we saw the familiar militarized police department in the streets of the predominantly African American community where Freddie Gray lived. President Obama sent newly sworn in Attorney General Loretta Lynch. We expect a complete investigation and a restructuring of the Baltimore Police Department or and or a consent decree to arise out of this incident as well. But on May 18th, 2015, as part of an effort to reduce tensions between law enforcement and the minority communities, according to the Washington Post, President Obama banned tracked armored vehicles, bayonets, grenade launchers. Can you believe they have that on the streets to deal with civilians? Ammunition of 50 caliber or higher and some, some types of camouflage uniforms that were being worn on the streets to deal with civilians, military gear, from being distributed. He, he banned these things from being distributed to local police departments. They were getting this surplus equipment free 
from our military and they were using it in primarily uh, communities of color. Tactical vehicles, <laughs> explosives, and riot equipment. They, they can still get that. But only if the police, uh, if the local police provide additional certification and assurances that the gear will be used responsibly. Do you think they didn't think they were using it responsibly when they were using it on our community? Okay, all right, that's me. I'm going off, right? Okay, so before this was done, our guest, Jamar Montgomery, systems engineer, Southern University Law Center uh, candidate for 2016, was one of the voices crying out for the demilitarization of our civilian communities. He is the author of Militarized Police and Unpermitted Protest, Implementing Policy That Civilizes the Police. Catchy topic there. <laughs> Thank you. And we believe one of the voices heard by the administration considering the implementation of this new policy. We want to welcome uh, Jamar Montgomery to the studio and um, you know we want you to feel free to, to chime in at any point. Dr. Plummer. Tell us what it means to have a militarized police. You know I'm ready to get into this subject. <laughs> get into it Dr. Plummer. Well uh, first I want to say thank you for having me on the show. Um, I feel honored to be around such great women. Um, uh, all attorneys, and uh, I'm in training, so uh, thank you for having me on the show. But um, militarized police, um, what does that mean? That means that you have police who utilize um, military tactics, utilize military training, and lastly, military weapons and equipment. Um, so what does it mean to be militarized? It means that you are now applying these tactics in the, from who are, supposed to be civil, on, who are supposed to be civilian police um, on a civilian population. The same tactics that you would see in Iraq, Afghanistan, in any war zone are now being applied to American citizens. That's a problem. So uh, when we look at the current trend of militarized police, it's only something that's been continuing going since the late since the early 60s. Um, LAPD was actually one of the pioneers of militarized police in implementing SWATs, which is Special Weapons and Tactics Team. Uh, it was one way of addressing uh, how to deal with riots, as a yeah. matter of fact, yeah. um, and by uh, Chief Gates, as a matter of fact. So, what, what do, do you find it interesting that you know? I want to be. I want to. No, I'm not going to be delicate about. It. I'm just going to say it. I find it interesting that after a sporting event, when um, Ohio State wins a basketball championship and they championship and they take to the streets. And they get all excited about having won that basketball championship. And they, they start rocking cars and turning over cars and setting cars on fire and just taking over the streets. But I cannot recall one time seeing a militarized police department addressing fans, because that's what they call them. They call them fans or they call them uh, excited fans. I never hear anybody, not in the news media, not the police addressing them as hooligans or thugs or any of that. Um, I just hear them address, call them excited fans. I am not condoning um, any uh, violent behavior, but there wasn't any violent behavior in some of these situations where they came up with these militarized police, they, there were peaceful protests that members of certain police departments didn't want to understand. They just wanted them to be silent and get out of the way. Am, um, am I off on that? I don't think that it was necessarily that they don't understand. I believe that they truly do understand. The issue is you're dealing with one, unrest. And on the other hand, people exercising their constitutional rights. So now you get an idea of how um, that local government feels about people of color exercising their constitutional rights. So in one sense, you can have angry fans who have lost, who their team has just lost out there acting the fool. Um, but when you have peaceful protests that initially were peaceful, but the moment that you come up with a take, 
the conversation changes. And not only a tank, but you have mil you have these fifty caliber or higher guns that you actually have trained on the citizens of that community. And I want to just think about how General Russell Honore addressed that Dr. Plummer when he came into New Orleans and those people, the military, they, that's what they were brought in to do. And they had those guns trained on the citizens of New Orleans. And, and General Honore said, and I won't use his exact words, but he said, put those guns down. Aim them down. These people are just trying to get out of here. They're trying to, to get to some assistance and you're training a gun on them. We need people like that in, in our police departments. Am I correct? Yes, we do. Uh, the problem is, is whenever you have officers that go to speak out for what's right, they either transfer them, they don't promote them. It's that kind of behavior is discouraged. And it's now, you're supposed to be, you take an oath as an officer. You take an oath. But now when you're standing up for what's right, it's now, the question now becomes, well, where do your loyalties lie? Because now that, that the culture of the earth, us versus them mentality gets perpetuated, unfortunately. Because, yes, as the caller said, there are, uh, there are many good police officers. However, when you have a culture that has permeated uh, throughout a police department, throughout an agency, you can no longer just say, oh, well, it was just that police officer. No. This is something that is encouraged. Because police officers are sworn to uphold the law no matter who is breaking the law. Absolutely. And so if you are a part of a police department and you know that something is going on that is illegal, like someone abusing a prisoner, you have an obligation to report that and... You, because if you don't, you're a part of an of, of an obstruction of justice or a conspiracy to 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 um to um circumvent the law, right? Well, it's it, if you and I were to break the law, uh, we're personally liable. Police officer breaks the law, we again are liable. Why? Because when the the police department, the city gets sued. It's our tax dollars that go to pay that settlement. That's right. It doesn't come out of the police officer's paycheck. That's right. He doesn't have to worry about that. Why? Because he's acting under the quote-unquote color of the law. So he's protected by that. But, but under 1983, uh, 42 U.S.C. 1983, they can be held personally accountable if there are thorough investigations that show that they were either complicit or that they played some role in the injury that uh, a citizen has sustained. But what general, what we see generally happens, and it's not with all police departments, I'm not trying to paint everybody with the same brush, but the police department has a responsibility to get rid of those bad apples. And if they don't get rid of them, then they become a part of, uh, you know, the, the, of the crime. Obstruction of justice should apply to police officers in the same way that it does to any of us, any other person. And, and the only people who can give us the information, who can, can except for now, you know, God has a plan. It's perfect. Everybody's got a, a camera phone. Um, and I think that, you know, the police, the, the police department having the cameras, the body cameras, as well as the, uh, the dash cam cameras, that helps. But we need police officers who are just as offended by